Hi, welcome to another video by Fortune Buchholz at NotFortuneSchool.com and I just wanted to thank everyone for the positive response to my most recent video about Chiro Marchetti's Fantasy Echo Kipper cards 1 through 13. So since I got so much response I wanted to go ahead as soon as I had a moment and give you the next set of cards 14 through 26. So um, you know, that's just what I'm going to do, and I'm going to, you know, pretty much just talk about them in the same style that I did for the first video. And if you haven't seen that, please go ahead and look back in my playlist, and then you can uh, watch that. So then after I finish this video and finish up the remaining cards, remember Kipper's deck, uh, Chiro's Kipper deck has 39 cards, unlike the traditional 36. And if you want to know more about those extra cards, again, I want to point you back in my playlist to the extras video where I talk about those and the history of those, right, and where they come from and why they're just so awesome. Um, then I'll just go ahead and I will offer you another historical Kipper spread, which is, um, uh, we, shall we say, a, a kind of layout of 16. Right, so uh, we'll talk. Well, you'll see that you know in the next couple of weeks after we finish up the other video. So just go ahead and, and look for that. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Let's get started with Chiro Marchetti's uh, card 14. Remember the the insights or ideas that I'm giving you are mine. How I use the Kipper. Again, there is no Kipper dictator, right? The Kipper is very useful for contemporary life, even though it comes from you know uh, the 19th century. Um, it still has a structure that's very psychological, very interesting, very flexible, with many people and interior cards that represent psychological states. Again, I read them like a novel, for those of you who are just sort of joining in now. So we're going to talk about, you know, these novelistic, almost Dickensian aspects um, as we, you know, kind of go through. All right, so uh, those of you who watched the first video may remember that I talked about um, card seven, a pleasant message or a message, right, as over overwhelmingly and usually a positive message. But, you know, the Kipper is balanced. It has the this duality. It has these opposites. It has the pleasant message and the not so pleasant message. And here we see this in card 14 in Chiro's deck, which you can still buy from his website, right? And this is the message of concern. You can see that this lady is so shocked by what she's reading. She's going, oh! right, with her hand to her chest in surprise, dismay, right? Um, so that's just the uh, the image that we uh, see here. This is, of course, a negative card, a challenging card, right? And so you see the lady uh, standing in front of her writing desk as she opens the evening mail and receives this uh, surprising and even shocking, uh, unpleasant message. Um, what I like about this is is that you can see, you know, in the Victorian times when Chiro has. Uh, place the, where Chiro has placed this deck, you can see, you, you know that the mail came several times a day. And so from the her dress and from the decor, the Tiffany lamp being on, you can tell that this came in the, the evening mail, right? So this could also be a, you know, a late message or a message that comes um, after a series of events have um, happened and you can um, you know interpret that in the context of the question as works for you so we see her face registering surprise in the light of a Tiffany lamp and her a hand leaps to her heart in dismay so this is a disappointing news a setback it's not what you wanted to hear as I said it also can represent lateness because of the evening hour uh, it can be a small crisis or a quarrel unless it's with the false person right? Kipper 8, in which case everything will dissolve and it was all a misunderstanding, right? Because Kipper 8 has the ability to turn, um, you know, even challenging cards to their opposite. So this is a case where if it were with a false person, we could see that, you know, there'll be this misunderstanding, this initial surprise, this dismay, but then that will turn out to be a mistake, a, a false understanding. So let's uh, just put that down and please we'll just, uh, you know, go ahead and go on. So the next card is 15. This is a card a lot of people have asked me about. The original German title for this is um, A Good Outcome in Love, right? Again, this goes back to what I said in the first video where, you know, you were presented with people to get married, uh, then you got married in card three, <laughs> you know, and you you hoped it all came out for the best, right? Um, 
And so uh, I often call this card a good match. This gives it kind of a Jane Austen feeling as well. You know, we've got these two people who, you know, kind of circle warily around each other and, you know, is it a good match? They get married, is it gonna work out? You know, are we gonna have the pride and prejudice situation? So um, I'll just kind of make that reference. But you know, this really is what everybody hopes for in the 19th century, the good match. Again, uh, all the books of Jane Austen are about this subject matter. So if you've ever read any Jane Austen, you totally get this card. Uh, Chiro uh, illustrates two mated turtle doves that coo in an Italian garden with, shall we say, an ardent piece of statuary. So uh, we take this as romantic love, profound friendship, loyalty, and trust. But again, if it's with uh, Kipper 8, the false person, beware, because you may be manipulated, you may be in involved with a cheat and cheater, a gold digger, a con artist, uh, a narcissist. So kind of, you know, watch out for that, right, that kind of placement. Uh, so then let's go ahead to really what I think is one of the most brilliant innovations or, you know, most useful cards in the Kipper deck. And one of the reasons that I am so fond um, of this deck is Thoughts, card 16. Now, this is uh, in German. It's uh, Seine Gedanken, uh, the thought, uh, one's thoughts or his thoughts, right? Um, uh, you know, and this has kind of it given some people the idea that it's always about another person's thoughts, particularly like the guy's thoughts. Those of you who uh, read cards for yourself or other people often uh, struggle with this third party reading question, you know, is he thinking of me, right? Um, and that's somewhat difficult to answer concretely with the Tarot or with the Lenormand. Here at last we have a card that uh, takes on the question of thoughts, specifically very interior card, right? Uh, I, of course, still am not a fan of the third party reading and I will uh, attempt to reorient the client question, um, sort of flip that around, you know, why is it so important that other people are thinking about you? Why have you given your power away to, uh, you know, to someone? Why have you given your self-esteem over to someone? Why do you care whether some random stranger, person you barely know, someone you went on one date with, whatever, you know, is thinking about you? Why have you rest your rested your self-esteem there, right? So th these are very pointed questions that I will ask my uh, co-sitters because, you know, it's not an issue of whether some X or Y is thinking of you at A or B time, right? It's a question of why you, you don't own your own self-regard. And uh, that's something that, you know, a lot of people have been taught, as I've said before, always to please other people and not to please themselves. And that sometimes comes to uh, a shock to people to realize that even though intellectually they know they should have their own self-esteem and rest in their own self-regard, they still find themselves reacting in these ways using uh, ancient defenses which may or may, may not be serving them. Well, so let's just go ahead and talk about this card. Uh, this, the thoughts are generally positive. It addresses, a, a, you know, actual what you're thinking and matters that are on your mind. Um, what I love about this card also is that because we see an artist in the studio sort of adrift in his vision and working to realize his perfect portrait of a lady, sort of a Pygmalion moment, right? All of this is sort of floating behind him on his easel. It's sort of a, a thought, that which has yet to be manifested or unrealized, right? Um, I, I, I love this um, card because it can also now in Chiro's scheme represent all kinds of artistic projects, right? Before, as we go through, you can see that there are a number of forms of employment and uh, occupation uh, that happen in the Kipper, but there was never really one that was so fantastic for artistic or creative pursuits. You could kind of try to layer that on uh, the great beauty, Kipper 12, the rich young girl, right? Because, you know, she stands for all kinds of luxury, beauty, and creativity. But, you know, as a project per se, or as a creative or work project, artistic project, I was never, you know, I never really was happy sort of just piling on more and more meaning onto that particular card. And, and so I like sort of taking the burden off the great beauty there and placing it here on this card. So 
Uh, let's talk about the directionality again. Um, so, you know, when I talk about cards forward and back, right, I usually uh, am interested in how the card is facing for the in front of or the in bind of, and this is, of course, above, and this is, of course, below, right? Um, just to clarify that for people who've asked me, you know, what is directionality and what does it mean, right? So some cards are unclear and you have to experiment and see what works for you, but in general, that's uh, how I do it. So, you know, directionality is going to be, I'm sorry, the cards are reversed, right? So the directionality here forward is going to be this way for this guy pointing this way off camera. Okay. Uh, so the card above this card, right, is generally going to be the main preoccupation of what's on your mind. The one below, right, is generally what's being repressed, the thought that you are um, avoiding, what you are denying. But of course, it all depends on the context of the question, right? So always interpret directionality in the surrounding cards in light of the question, right? Um, and of course, if this is surrounded by challenging cards, uh, it may reveal things you don't want to know, <laughs> right? So I want to encourage uh, people here not to sugarcoat uh, this card. This is a card that's easy to, uh, you know, turn into a fluffy bunny. So don't do that. Read the Kipper Plain. It, like the Lenormand, uh, can be very direct and will deliver some very strict news, although it sometimes has a reputation for being an overly light and happy deck compared to, say, the Pixie deck, the Rider Waite Smith Tarot, or to the Lenormand. It, it can actually be quite cutting, so, you know, just read it plain and tell it straight. Uh, so more abstractly, if it's next to a significator card, it can describe a thoughtful person or also indicate the need for contemplation, meditation, reevaluation. Um, and I just, as I said, I just think there's a lot of uh, advantages here to Kipper's non to Chiro's non-traditional presentation of this card, and and I've come to like it a lot. All right, let's talk about the gift card 17. Uh, now, this is obviously a very positive and a very enabling card, right? So what we see here is, is we kind of see uh, as if someone's handing something to you, so you're sort of outside of this card, right? So while the significator is, I don't know, you know, relaxing in the family room, uh, card 21, by a cozy fire, you know, here's the surprise. You have a trinket wrapped in chased gold paper and topped with a really sweet homemade silk bow. So this is literally gifts, aid, support, resources, rescue, joy. It's always exactly what you need physically, mentally, spiritually. This is a very powerful card and it, it is similar to the false person in that it has the ability to change or, or flip nearby cards to their opposite. So if it's you know next to a challenging card, or what we or what some people call a negative card, right? It turns it into a positive card. It softens the blow, right? Uh, so then, then to continue into the you know um, timing scheme of the Kipper, right? Where card seven is one week, card fourteen, right? Uh, sad news can be two weeks because you know, 14 days. This card has a really unique timing uh, situation where it means the next uh, holiday or your birthday or Christmas, right? Um, so that's just kind of an interesting thing, you know, when will this happen? If this card comes up, you may say, well, when is the next holiday? When is your birthday? When is Christmas? When is the next major sort of, you know, holiday event? And that's kind of what this card is pointing to uh, time-wise. When I'm talking seasonally, I also use it for winter, Christmas, or Yule. Um, and uh, also because I do like to talk about uh, the Kipper in a contemporary context, since I have many contemporary sitters, right, who have contemporary lifestyles, um, I do also like to use the gift as the other gendered partner of the other gendered or non-dual gendered child card. And this is a case where, you know, uh, how people identify, right? We will now, now nowadays meet people who, you know, consider themselves non-dual gendered or other gendered. And for them, we like to use the child card. And if they ask about a, a relationship with a similar, uh, similarly identifying person, then I will use the gift you know, according to their self-identification. So just 
you know, to throw that in because we do live in a, you know, post Caitlyn Jenner world and we are going to be faced more and more, uh, luckily and beautifully with, uh, you know, contemporary society. So we want to respond to that in a respectful, dignified and diverse way. So this is a, a beautiful use of this card. So speaking of that, here is card 18, the child. We just talked about this as the significator for non-dual gendered people or for literal children, right? Um, so the an interesting fact about this card is this is actually a picture of Chiro's daughter as a child. So that's just a really sweet thing uh, to know about the deck. And we meet this happy, charming child in traditional Victorian frilly clothes, clutching their cozy stuffed bunny as they stand in a lovely Victorian nursery. It's like the whole thing is completely Mary Poppins, right? So uh, again, I take it as a child up to a young tween, right? And in keeping, you know, with the time, right? Because when everybody all children, whether male or female, wore, you know, ruffles and petticoats and you all look like little Lord Fauntleroy, right? Um, there's this moment opened by this card when uh, you have a time before society imposes the duties and boundaries and some people consider the stifling uh, responsibilities of, of gender. So uh, this is why I like to use the child for people who have uh, contemporary identifications and I think it's a very respectful and uh, useful you know um, card for this. Uh, so if you meet someone who is middle sexed as I said or or has some other identification I do like this card but more abstractly it does represent innocence, naivete, the new, the simple, the small. Um, and I also like to use it for spring, Easter, or austera, although other people differ and use different cards, so do experiment with that, you know, for yourself. Okay, let's go on to Coffin. As in the Lenormand, we have Coffin, right? Chiro's done a very nice uh, take on this. I particularly love the way that he has made the layers of the art so that the stained glass glows out, giving this card a, a very hopeful uh, feel, which you don't always see in traditional versions um, of the Kipper or in traditional versions of the Lenormand. So I like that. And, and I think he's done that uh, as a service to people because often people see this card and they immediately kind of fly to tarot mind and they say, oh my God, you know, death. Uh. So it, it's a neutral to challenging card and it depends heavily on those around it and the context, right? Um, so, you know, we see this chapel lit with in this beautiful way through this lovely Art Nouveau stained glass. It's a flower, right? A blossoming, you know, the flower motif is so important throughout this deck. And I've already talked about the 19th century language of flowers. I just happen to love this. So, um, you know, to me, this looks like a half open rose. Some people have said it's a magnolia. Um, and other people have argued that it could be a half open camellia. So we can talk about kind of, you know, those those flowers. Uh, Chiro Marchetti himself now does live in the south in Florida. So it may be that he is inspired by these southern flowers, right? Um, and that's something that I think would be interesting to, you know, to talk to him about, but just just look carefully at the concept of this, you know, opening or budding, budding flower. You know, this is not a dead or drooping flower. This is a flower that is about to open in a new way. And so that's, you know, that's a, a positive um, message that I just want to offer people who have an immediate gut reaction when they see this card for the first time. So, uh, you know, uh, you stand before this carved mahogany coffin on a simple beer. It's bathed in so soft candlelight. It encourages contemplation, right? Not fear or retreat or reaction, but contemplation with yourself. Um, so literally in the Kipper, this card represents a box, a trunk, a drawer, a chest, something that is closed, right? What's nailed shut, something that's final, over, finished, done. Right? So that's what we want to look at, you know, first of all, the concept of finality. So if we see the child as something that's new, something that's starting, something that's beginning, this card is what's over. Bingo, bam, it's done, right? 
uh, just, you know, bury it and walk away because you're done with it and it's time for you to go do something more, much more awesome, right? Um, so it's behind you now, right? Whatever is represented by this card. And that's, you know, often really good for people because they, they can't move on. They don't know if it's finished. They're not sure how they feel about something. And this is just, you know, as I said, put a nail on it, shut it, it's done. Kaput, right? Move on to the next. Um, now, other people will talk about or try to talk about this card in terms of health issues. Everybody knows, I think I've made this very clear, but I'm just going to go ahead and repeat this. I don't think it's ethical to discuss health issues with your clients personally. You know, I'm not a doctor and I can't play one on the internet or over a card table. So I'm just not going to. And the most that I would ever say to clients, you know, who have health concerns, I would simply say, if you feel like you need to see the doctor, then you should definitely go. Listen to your intuition. If you're not happy with what your first doctor tells you, listen to your intuition and get a second opinion. More than that, I think it's not ethical to say. And so I certainly, you know, wouldn't go there. Even though sometimes as I do grand tableaus for people, clients themselves will see this card and they will go there. But I certainly, you know, never will. Cards should mirror the client's consciousness. So if that's something that is a concern or a fear for the client, it's useful for them to air that, talk that out with themselves, right? And uh, assuage whatever anxiety they have, you know, self-comfort in that way with our support, right? Um, because we should, in a Rogerian manner, offer our clients, you know, unconditional positive regard. But don't, you know, don't yourself go there. I, I don't think that is the right thing to do. So um, I also like to use this card for evening and for night. When other challenging cards are also next to it, consider anger, rage, destruction, and malice as emotional states or descriptors, right? And this uh, differs from how it's often used in Lenormand, where we often describe people uh, with this card as someone who's, you know, tall, thin, pale, nervous, sensitive. Uh, that's not its, its use here, so that's a, a kind of an interesting difference. Okay, so let's go ahead and go on. The house. This is such a great, great card, particularly now that I am in Pittsburgh where so many of these elaborate old Queen Anne and Victorian style houses exist, right? And so I can just walk through my neighborhood here, which uh, fortunately I have this great privilege to say is a very upscale neighborhood in Pittsburgh, not too far from the university. Um, and so we see a lot of houses alike, uh, you know, like this. Uh, of course, the scene that Chiro depicts here um, is you, you know, you're looking in. Again, this is a case of you, the significator, you, the sitter, you, the querent, uh, is, has arrived in the carriage to this fine wrought iron gate of a very impressive five-story Queen Anne mansion, and it blazes with the modern gas light, right? Uh, but what's interesting is what's behind here, right, is this interesting sky phenomenon. Is it a waning moon? Is it an eclipse of the sun? Are we coming for a dinner? Are we coming for a ball? This, it, there's a kind of a feeling of potential and suspense here. So that's what I think is interesting about the mood of this card as opposed to the more just staid picture of the Lenormand house. Um, so literally, of course, this is a house, a home, a property, real estate, land dealings, buildings, right? And more abstractly, it's safety, family, coziness, security, your foundation, you know, where you have settled in life. Uh, it's the things that you hold and that hold you. So we get from this idea the concept of the longer term, like such as for investments. So since generally when you move into a new house, it takes about six months to get everything arranged. Um, I also take this as a timing suggestion that this is a card that indicates about six months, right? So you can see that, you know, this is a really great. We have cards for day. We have the coffin for night, right? We have cards for one week, two weeks, a month, three months, six months, more than a year. We have seasonal cards. So this is the, the hierarchical timing that you see in the Kipper, and this is, a, uh, uh, this is involved in that structure. So let's go ahead and talk about the card 21, the drawing room, the living room, the family room, right? I like to use the term drawing room because that is sort of the room that is depicted 
in the traditional kipper deck, and that's how we would call it in English, not necessarily a living room or a family room. The living room would be uh, more personal than uh, this is, although this is a personal and familiar uh, familial card. So let's go ahead and talk about this. I love the way that he has illustrated this uh, with mid-morning coffee laid in a silver service in this lovely uh, bourgeois drawing room. So again, if we think about Dana, Jane Austen or, or Dickens, remember we have all these series of rooms, right? And this series of rooms indicate sort of the social and psychological spaces that are dictated by you know geography or by by housing and that's a kind of an interesting concept that we don't really have anymore where we have all these open plan houses but here you have states of mind states of emotion states of being and closeness of relationships indicated by which room you receive people in and which room you're sitting in at any particular time so uh, leave that that possibility or that understanding open in your mind and let that kind of inform uh, you know, the reading or the meaning as you go through in the context of the question, right? Um, so the drawing room in better houses, uh, you know, it was off the formal parlor. It was a place to quote unquote withdraw, which is how it's got its name drawing room, right? And it's for entertaining close friends and family, unlike the formal parlor, which is, you know, for guests and company. And that's where we see the mature female card six, Kipper six, right? Uh, the rich lady uh, entertaining in her formal parlor in her formal and elaborate day dress, right? Uh, so we now we're in a welcoming and supportive space, right? So you can have uh, light secrets and personal matters will be shared here, right? Um, so of course, since it's literally, it's a room, it stands for all private and enclosed spaces, living rooms, hotel rooms, offices with doors. It can be your apartment. It represents, in an abstract manner, privacy, everything which is close and personal to you, right? And this sense of close offers a, 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 a location and a time hit, right? So if somebody says, you know, when is it? And you get this card, it's close to you. It's in the room with you right? It's, it's, it's near, right? <laughs> it's right next to you. It's shortly, right? Certainly not more than a month. Uh, and so if we balance this, say, again, in this concept of duality and balancing that we see in the Kipper, it balances journey 10, right? Kipper 10, the journey card, which, you know, so this means staying put, not traveling, right? There's a sense of also being present and not absent, Right? Um, so that's, you know, what I want to say about this card. So let's go ahead then to this next card, 22. This card is traditionally a military person, a military officer, an official, right? You can see here Chiro has illustrated him in the classic BBC mode as a British field marshal. And I love that. I love this representation. And this, the second that I saw this again, I immediately went back to just about every version of Jane Austen you have ever seen, <laughs> right? Where, you know, there's always some moment where the family meets society and interacts with, you know, the military during the Napoleonic Wars. So you would see a, a character like this who has a certain defined quality, which, you know, all of you who've read Austin or seen these movies are, are very familiar with. And this is a another great way that Chiro has updated these cards and immediately made them uh, emotionally and psychologically legible to us. So that's just really another success on Chiro's part. Uh, he's a somewhat challenging card. Right? So, um, you know, he's the field marshal in the marble foyer of his officer's club, right? And he greets us with his, you know, fine martial bearing and his notch saber. He's got tons of medals from his imperial campaigns and they really gleam against his bright red coat. This is a very accomplished person. Uh, so he's a military man, uh, a police officer, a fireman, any guy in uniform, any person in uniform. Um, I've also seen this come up for women in uniform uh, and as a descriptor of another person card he has military characteristics gruff forceful crisp humorless sharp maybe even sarcastic and dismissive um, the field marshal is a person who loves ceremony pomp hierarchy his regiments and his orders if the it's a question about whether someone will do something if you give a task to the field marshal he will make it so right um and 
It can, in certain circumstances, next to other people for non-person cards, represent for it's happening whether you like it or not. Because, you know, it's official. It's going forward according to the prescribed process, which is outside of you and outside of your control. Someone else is giving the marching orders, right? Sometimes that happens in life, and this is a card that indicates that. So just, again, be aware of that. So let's go ahead to card 23, right? So this is the court, and here uh, we can see uh, the royal court is ex actually the building that appears to be depicted, the London Royal Court. You can go see it in, uh, in you know, London. Uh, this is another somewhat challenging to neutral card. So you meet a solicitor of the royal court, and he's coming from the proceedings in his wig. He's got the white collar. He's got the gown, right? Again, this is another BBC moment. So uh, literally, the royal court is lawsuits, court proceedings, divorces, wills, contracts, disputes, all legal matters, right? Um, but the feeling here is that your solicitor is awesome. This guy here who's representing you is awesome. So the outcome is likely to be good, especially if it's near enabling or positive cards. But far away, right, far away in the grand tableau or surrounded by other challenging cards, beware, you should talk to your lawyer and consider settling. Uh, so from this sense also comes the more abstract notion of negotiations, right? And since the Royal Court is a formal public building, it can also represent other formal uh, public buildings like City Hall, Post Offices, the Motor Vehicle Bureau, etc. So here's Chiro's card, the courthouse. Awesome. So let's keep going and let's talk about Thief card that's also familiar to people from the Lenormand, right? This is a very challenging and very negative card, right? So we've seen a dark and foggy mew with distant gas lamps on the wrong side of Marble Arch. And if you're not familiar with the architecture um, of London, you should go ahead and look up what it means to be on the wrong side of Marshall, uh, Marble Arch. It means to be lowborn and dodgy and you know not so awesome. So in the, the spectrum of the social hierarchy that we see displayed in the original Kipper and which Chiro has translated to the more uh, you know, familiar Victorian times, we are, we all know, you know, this Oliver Twist moment, this level of society, again, that's very familiar to us from Dickens. And uh, this is kind of, you know, what we see here. This is the ragamuffin pickpocket, the thief, right? So literally, it's theft, embezzlement, or loss. You can see that he's got, you know, our friend here, a gentleman who is kind of in bad, bad straits and in bad company. You can see he has, shall we say, a dissolute lady of the evening who, you know, he's in a bad situation, right? He's got bad company, he's got bad friends, and he's he's set up for, you know, a, a big loss, right? So literally we've got theft, embezzlement, loss, material or emotional, right? If the card is, and again I'm going to talk about directionality, so if the card is above or in front of the significator card, you can make this loss back, you can recoup it. Right, but far, far away, below or behind, and when reinforced, certainly by other challenging cards. I'm sorry, dude, you know, you've hit a bump and it's likely gone forever. So you might want to brainstorm ways to work around this obstacle. So more abstractly, it stands for what's been taken away, removed, separated, distant, absent, what's been lessened, right? So again, in that duality, you know, you have more, you have less, you have small, you have large. So uh, here we are for this one. Speaking now of the tall or the large, we have one of the cards I think that is the most misunderstood in Chiro Marchetti's presentation and is certainly quite misunderstood in the original deck. So if you look at the original Kipper deck, if you can happen to find that online, you can see that it, it depicts a castle uh, high on a hill the um, uh, Hochschwalstein, which is uh, the castle that <laughs> castle of Maximilian II, in which Ludwig, who was the king of Bavaria at the time, this deck looks back to in nostalgia, right, was born. 
Um, and it depicts that uh, there, and you can see it from the perspective of one of the small houses on the hillside. And, and if you have any questions about that, you can just definitely go up and look up that castle, and you'll see immediately that that is the one that's actually depicted on the card. So uh, that's just sort of an interesting historical note. So here, Chao has you know removed it from this very specific Bavarian uh, site, which almost no one outside of Germany uh, would understand, uh, to the uh, concept really of um, you know, high honors, which in Victorian times would have been the 21 gun salute. And this is what you see. You see three cannon and they are firing seven times. This is the military 21 gun salute. So this is it, dude. You've made it. You've got it. This is the highest honor you can, you can get, right? You're going to, the medal is on its way. And, you know, voila, this is the promotion that you wanted, right? So it's trophies, medals, honors, success, promotions, raise, ace and exam, literally graduating with honors. The significator is on his way up socially, professional, emotionally, you know, uh, the sky's the limit here. Uh, but more abstractly, it also represents anything high or tall, right? So if it's next to, say, the house or next to the courthouse, it could actually mean a skyscraper, a tall building, a tall apartment building. Right, so also keep that in mind. Next to a person, it could mean that they are a tall person, right? Um, so with, um, you know, royal court, as I said, or prison, it can, uh, Keeper 29, uh, it can stand for landmark, skyscraper, tall public building, uh, right? Uh, but do be careful if it's next to false person, Kipper 8, or the thief, Kipper 24 then you may find that things come out their opposite and what looked like was coming your way is snatched away from you. That sometimes happens, right? Life is sometimes a bit unfair, so do uh, kind of do watch out for that. Then the last card in this series, because uh, we've gone a little long, we're already over 35 minutes, and I'm sorry about that, is my one of my favorite cards as well, Great Fortune. Hi. Um, this is definitely the most enabling, powerful, and positive card, right? Uh, here we see on the balcony, uh, again, right, think uh, Pride and Prejudice, when she's married Darcy and she walks to the end of the great balcony looking out at the statues there on the balustrades overlooking her great lawn, right? Uh, we meet the goddess Fortuna in marble and she's gilded by the blazing sunset of success, right? Her horn of plenty pours wealth freely. Uh, again, all of your wishes are coming true. It's outstanding good luck, triumph, wealth, happiness, fruitfulness. Everything is delightful and it's aligned with your true purpose. Um, and like gift, Kipper 17, great fortune can turn challenging cards to the significator's benefit right? Nullifying the harmful effects. She intensifies positive cards next to her. And because of the Horn of Plenty, I like to use this card for summer. So uh, that is uh, all I want to say in this video. I don't want to make it too long. I want to keep it watchable. So we'll do the last set of cards in another video in another couple of days. Again, uh, thank you for your positive support. Uh, I really am very grateful for how well everyone has received uh, this Kipper work and the Kipper videos. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, again, please don't hesitate to catch up with me on social media or on my website, and I'm more than happy to talk to all of you. So until I see you in another couple of days, have a great day and enjoy your cards.